Demanding multiple skills from a player is usually the sign of a well put together game. Any combination of the mental gymnastics one must perform to solve problems, technical ability, or attrition contributes to more dynamic gameplay and increases player retention. Managing all of these aspects at once is what Dishonored excels at. <coughs> uh, is something at which Dishonored excels. It released in 2012 for the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC. This review is in-depth and will feature spoilers for the entire game, including the gameplay mechanics and the story, and the music if that's something you care about. I suggest playing the game first and coming back to this video to fully grasp the specificity of all of the topics. Dishonored is a game best appreciated on repeat playthroughs because of all the possible playstyles, so I will now share the ways I played it to offer a more complete understanding of my perspective. I completed the game a total of 5 times. The first 3 were a few years ago on the Xbox 360, and the last 2 were recent on the PC. These are the runs I did in chronological order. 1. A high chaos run where I was somewhat diligent to stay stealthy but killed when necessary. 2. A high chaos run where I attempted to kill as many people as possible. 3. A stealth run with no detection. 4. Another standard run, but I was more diligent this time to remain stealthy and non-lethal, but still killed when necessary. The fifth and final run was a no sword, no powers, no gadgets challenge run. The only person I killed was the High Overseer, and I made an exception for the heart. 6. I played partway through the game on very hard difficulty as well. The game opens with the protagonist and the player character, Corvo, sitting on a boat returning to the Empress after being on a retrieval mission. The first few lines of prologue before this moment, voiced by Empress Jessamine Caldwin, explains how he was on a mission to seek help for the plague-destroying Dunwall. Upon arrival, the Empress's daughter, Emily, greets Corvo with an exuberated shout of his name, a hug, and a request to play hide-and-go-seek. Considering one of the major hallmarks of this game is stealth, it was a very wise decision to have hiding as the first mechanic taught to the player. It sets the precedent of non-lethality being the primary way the game should be played, at least on the first time through. And here is the first nitpick non-problem I have with Dishonored. It does such a brilliant job at teaching the player exactly the skill attempting to be taught. The only objective to hide and go seek is to remain hidden and not appear until the seeker resigns. The small area in which you play the game with Emily have opaque staircase railings, columns, walls to climb, a dumpster to climb into, and shrubs. It could barely be more clear what the player must do. A simple picture of the crouch button, B in my case, could have appeared on the screen. Upon witnessing what happens when you press B, the hiding would begin. It is an elegant tutorial, but instead Dishonored throws a page up that occupies the entire screen, telling you what button to press to crouch and the benefits of crouching and remaining out of sight of enemies. It's a non-problem because simply not having the page would have been just as effective, but it's still an educational and concise tutorial. In the sewers after escaping from the prison, it's possible to trip a wire that fires an incendiary bolt at you. An inattentive player would get hit by it, and an attentive player would move around the trap, disarm it, and acquire the bolt. Although this eliminates the need for a tutorial later on to demonstrate what that specific bolt does, you still get a page that explains them. A bit later on in the sewers is a pair of guards that are seen to be killed and devoured and disappear from a gang of hungry rats. You then use this knowledge a few seconds later to distract some rats with a dead body to crank a wheel. This again eliminates the need for a page later on showing how the devouring swarm power works, especially because there's a short explanation visible before buying the power, but the tutorial is still in the game. Dishonored has more examples of great conveyance and more simple tutorials, but committing to a global implementation of them would have been beneficial by making the tutorials more invisible. The less opaque and obvious a tutorial is, the more likely the player is to pay attention because they think they're playing the game proper, helping the player internalize the mechanics instead of memorize them. Perfect examples of this are the tutorials to Super Metroid and Mega Man X. Unless you know what's there and why it's there, the game is feeding you the mechanics in piecemeal until you're using multiple mechanics simultaneously. In the case of Super Metroid, there are platforms at multiple different heights that the player must jump over and onto, having them grow accustomed to the unique and nuanced jumping and aerial movement system. At no point, however, is there a notification telling the player, Press B to jump! This will launch you to the air over obstacles. Samuel the boat driver and Corvo arrive at an under-the-radar encampment run by the Loyalists. 
the palpability of irony is so high here that if you didn't at least smile the first time you noticed this, I know you weren't paying enough attention to know what was going on. Planting the seed of foreshadowing, the perfect name gives the player every indication to constantly analyze and be skeptical about every task whoever was assigned and every decision the loyalists make. To whom are they loyal? If they are loyal to this person or cause, why are they proclaiming such a thing? Is it Corvo? That's a rather bold statement to make, announcing your loyalty to a man you've never met and just busted out of prison. Why do they even need a name if their endeavors were spawned the moment of Corvo's imprisonment? How high up the priority list was a band name when they were plotting to neutralize the most powerful figures in Dunwall among all the other subsidiary targets? No one really ever provides in great detail specifically why Corvo's doing the things he's doing. They give just enough to prevent any questioning, like how a C student does just enough work to pass all of their classes. I would consider it odd that the person who's actually doing the assassinating is receiving the least information out of anyone. Various notes found around the Hound Pits where they're based also contribute to the already present skepticism. The note from Havelock's friend on the inside is likely the pinnacle of paraphernalia that detract from the loyalists. Perhaps I tried to investigate too deeply, but looking into the books that everyone that was running the operation didn't reveal any incriminating information about their mindsets. I expected to be able to assemble a personality about at least one of the people based on the books and poems and songs in the building. With all the literature around the place, the exclusion was wasted potential to give an analytical player the opportunity to better predict future events, or give returning players satisfying bits of info to snack on and relate to what they already know about the outcome. Anyway, the pub is essentially the hub for the majority of the game. You return here after every mission where you can purchase upgrades and equipment with the coins that you looted from your excursions. At first, it didn't make sense to me that you have to pay Piero. Presumably, he was recruited or actively sought out the people that became to be the loyalists to help you. If you're all working together, he should just be making whatever you ask for. But a note between him and Havelock reveals that they're strapped for resources so Piero can't frivolously experiment. They have to take any money that they can get from Corvo to arm and feed everyone. To help you find these runes, I give you this. The heart of a living thing. After Corvo goes to bed, he's visited by the outsider who gives him Blink in the heart. The heart is a unique item that doubles as a rune and bone charm finder and also as a lore dispenser. Attacking with it reveals some information about whatever you're doing at the moment. If it's pointed at a named character, it will reveal some information about them or their thoughts. However, it seems to pull at random from a pool of comments when pointing it at a guard or civilian. When pointed at no one, it will generally say something about the mission or a comment on Corvo's current status in the world. It's a really cool little device, but I wish more was done with it to make it a more robust gossiper. Perhaps aiming it at a civilian would reveal a combo to a safe somewhere, or maybe a civilian overheard one of the guards saying that they're going to skip their shift that night, giving the player an opening in the defenses. I once heard a guard in Coldridge Prison once mumble to himself that life is hard choosing between the plague or the military in the guardship. Someone like this likely wouldn't be sympathetic to being a guard very much, so maybe he would unlock a door or give you his key or otherwise help you accomplish your mission. The heart would tell you this so you can then choke him and have the option to press a button to release him so he can help you in some way. These events could occur at random and it would give the guards and civilians more of a sense of life and real people trying to stay alive in this crestfallen world. But maybe even some people or guards are sanguine despite the situation and are eager to help Corvo with whatever small resources they have, like an entire elixir. Ready to give up on the world, others could be the opposite and not care for life anymore so much that they give up their last remedy. I suppose I can only speak for myself, but this would incite so much empathy in me I begin to tear up. How heartbreaking is such a thing. Sometimes leaving information up to the imagination can be infinitely more vivid and real than having completely real graphics. The watercolor aesthetic accomplishes this because it doesn't include tiny visual details. How sickly would the weepers really look? How repulsive would it be to see them actually bleed out of their eyes? What would a swarm of rats literally breaking down a human corpse tissue by tissue look like in real life? How largely present and overwhelming would a 35-ton whale suspended by hooks and oozing unfamiliar liquids really feel like in front of your eyes? These images are so outright vulgar that attempting to emulate them with realistic graphics would not only not do justice to these ideas but actually detract from them because it would rob imagination from the minds witnessing these events. 
A powerful aesthetic is almost always better than realistic graphics for a few reasons. Firstly, on a more technical level, hardware is always advancing and we're constantly achieving better rendering quality. A year down the line, last year's realistic graphics will no longer look realistic. Secondly, a game with a unique aesthetic won't age nearly as fast because it's the aesthetic that a player will be looking at, not the resolution per se. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker still looks excellent to this day for that exact reason, and the original too, not even the HD remake. Finally, a well-considered aesthetic will almost always contribute to the theme of the game more than simply opting for the most realistic graphics that the engine and hardware will allow. Cell Shading Wind Waker contributed to its lighthearted and upbeat atmosphere. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule and rules to every exception. The Last of Us benefited from realistic graphics because it allowed more investment in the characters and highlighted how awful the world had become as a result of the outbreak. But the exception is how much more would The Last of Us have benefited if the graphics were more realistic? And when does it become a diminishing return? To back up my thoughts on a fitting aesthetic, Viktor Antonov, co-creator, says in an interview with Vice that, quote, photorealism in art is not interesting, unquote, and that, quote, photorealism is a false quest, and once you achieve it, it doesn't tell you anything, unquote. I think he's spot on because photorealism simply describes the world. It completely fails to interpret it, and all video games are about is interpreting the world in a very narrow, specific way and generating rules of engagement for that interpretation. You did it. Unlike other games that use the first-person perspective seemingly just to get high sales figures, Dishonored opted for this camera because it fits the type of gameplay perfectly and more metaphorically represents Corvo's position in the world among the loyalists. Everyone at the pub is in on the plan except for Corvo and the maids. The player sees through his eyes in first person because that's what Corvo sees. He can't sense anything around him naturally. He would have to turn around to catch what's behind him, but that just cloaks what was previously visible. He always has a blind spot, which is the major trait that the loyalists are relying upon to get their job done and use Corvo until he's no longer useful. In first person, you can learn some information that would be useful. You can read letters or look for clues that might indicate something malicious, but it's limited by the inability to escape the first person and see the world with more clarity or objective truth. This is the position Corvo is in, and it's valuable for this to be the position the player is in because it immerses them in the lie being spun. Corvo can't see the Emperor's new clothes, which makes the loyalist deceit that much more devious. A third-person perspective would detract from and mismatch this motif because it would fly in contrast to all of these elements. Even if you're not convinced by that, how a third-person perspective would less fortify the gameplay ought to be convincing. Understanding perspective is all about understanding space, so before I get straight into the game, allow me to take a step back to offer a more capacious view of the topic. In the architecture field, there is a type of drawing called a section. It's like a plan, but upright. Imagine cutting a cake. The knife goes from top to bottom, and separating the two halves reveals the layers from the side. Now imagine moving your viewpoint back to infinity so it removes all perspective and you get a flat projection of that side view. This is generally considered one of the most important ways to think about architectural design because architecture is designed for people, and people live in the first person. People live in section. An object design only in plan is something like a maze where all the complexity can only be understood and seen from the top-down view. To the person inside the maze, however, all they're seeing is walls on all four sides of them. But once walls begin changing height and multiple levels are introduced, it enriches the experience of being within that space because it takes advantage of all of space's three dimensions. Dishonored's first-person approach means that the player must engage their spatial reasoning more often and deeper than they would in third-person. Arguing that moving the camera only slightly back from the player character doesn't change much regarding spatial reasoning or the amount of information present on screen at any given moment, but I argue that the psychological effect is potent enough to discount that argument. Considering that people do live in the first person, being forced to take on this perspective in the game forces them to think more critically about the environment and use their predictive skills to shape situations in their favor. And being caught by a guard feels more persuasive and compelling because you are being caught not some character in a game. It's more motivating to act carefully. Care doesn't necessarily apply only to stealth because even playing with high chaos requires it. On the topic of guards, they need more diversity. 
The Brigmore Witches DLC, which I'll talk about later, did an excellent job with this, and so did Knife of Dunwall, but to a lesser extent. All the guards in the game are exactly the same, excepting the tall boys. There are a couple different outfits, but they're all skins because there is no functional difference between them. Sokolov, whose name and occupation I think might be an homage to Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, invented so many different stationary devices to kill people instantly, but he never implemented that technology into portable weapons? What if there were elite guards that used electrified swords that dealt more damage? Or the concept of the overseer music was somehow implemented into the sword so if Corvo or Dowd got hit by one, it would temporarily disable power usage for a few seconds. Traits could also exist for their outfits, meaning that some guards could maybe have a light on their head. The advantage is that you could see them from further away and know to avoid them, but the drawback is that if you do cross paths with them, they could more easily spot you in poorly lit areas. Similarly, another guard type could have a device that acted like a telescope that allowed him to see further but resulted in eliminating peripheral vision. And how about projectiles? There are incendiary bolts and sleep darts laying around everywhere, but no guards use them. It would be interesting to have some guards fire a type of dart that temporarily disoriented Corvo, making him slightly more difficult to control and making the screen a bit fuzzy. One might argue, if the guards had the accuracy with the bolt to just make Corvo dizzy for a bit, why wouldn't they use a gun that could kill them? To that, I say that rendering Corvo somewhat disabled would make it easier for the other surrounding guards to kill Corvo if he can't flee or fight back as effectively. Fleeing is a strategy that always works in Dishonored. No matter how bad of a situation you get yourself into, you can always seek reprieve on the rooftops. If the city of Dunwall is so worried about Corvo that they would implement a stricter lockdown procedure in Coldridge and put up a 100,000 coin reward for his capture or murder, wouldn't it also be prudent to better train the guards? A specialty unit could be better at climbing, so although they wouldn't be able to blink and catch up with Corvo quickly, the player would still have to worry about a guard being on their tail. Maybe all of these ideas are dumb. As I state elsewhere in the video, Dishonored is generally simple and elegant in how it executes most things, so having a variety of guard types would disrupt this simplicity and negatively affect the game as a whole. I'm undecided if guard variety is a good idea or not, but I think it's viable to at least think of the different possibilities and how they would affect the gameplay and the concept of stealth. Barking is a characteristic of AI programming in video games that alerts the players to the NPC's actions. We always want smart AI in games, but what would we actually need is dumber AI. Enemy NPCs that act more like humans and less like artifices of a game world would seem to be more unfair. If you're sneaking around in the shadows and made the mistake of sprinting for a short second but a guard heard that and wandered over, as any human naturally would, it would likely seem that you were a victim of random behavior or the game automatically knowing your location. But if the guard says, huh? Or what was that? then you know they're coming and you can plan accordingly. And when they dismiss it as, probably just rats, into everything, then you know they've stopped investigating. Or after some time of hiding from guards after they've spotted you and you hear them say, lost him, or he got away, then you know they've stopped actively pursuing you and lowered to high alert. Games are simulations that offer, hopefully, clear rules on how a participant interacts with that system. When those rules become too nebulous, the participant will likely attribute this to a poorly constructed simulation that does whatever it wants. Can I point out your heart rate just increased? Uh, yeah. Well, it should've, because there's a huge crazy spider. <laughs> so. You see a spider? You don't, you don't see Black Mirror, a TV series, addresses this in one of its episodes, Playtest. Some guy goes to a facility to test out experimental VR technology. The program running the VR is hooked into his brain and begins to learn from him, and learn about reality by extension to the point that he doesn't know if the simulation ends it or not, or even if the people monitoring him are real. It's a fascinating episode among a thrilling series that I totally recommend, but it serves as a great analogy to prove that games can't be too smart or else players will think that they're too unfair. Dishonored simply implements barking well, but doesn't do anything revolutionary, so I won't linger on the topic any longer. Listening to characters of all kinds throughout the world generally offers interesting insight into their daily lives. Corvo is simply another person in this world, and stumbling upon these random conversations enforces the idea that these people have lives outside of Corvo's presence in the world. 
However, homogeny is very apparent in the pool of offhand comments that the characters make, especially the guards. Shall we gather for whiskey and cigars tonight? Has become a running joke. Nearly any video or post of any kind will feature this line because the guards say it so often. I can complain that the pool is too shallow and a wider assortment of lines is necessary to make this world more convincing, but I find it quite charming. It adds a character to the game that doesn't come from the game itself, but from the perception of the game from all of its players, and that appeals to me. It would appear, sl it would appear sloppy and poorly considered if the rest of the game were as two-dimensional, but it's not, so it doesn't. Multiple playstyles are handled very well from stealth to high chaos to everything in between. Meaningful consequences and the player's use of foresight ensure that whether you're waiting in the shadows in fear of detection or gallivanting about murdering every moving object with a pulse is engaging and rewarding. It works out like this because Dishonored requires a player to wholly grasp the past, present, and future time frames to make an educated decision about their actions. Whether or not the guards are on high alert because they've seen Corvo before, all of the guards' current positions, or where they will be in your future objective all feed the stream of decisions the player is constantly making. If even one of those elements is missing from the deliberation, detrimental decisions are easy to make. Separating the three time frames into three distinct categories makes them feel palpable, and thus easy to understand and allow speedy evaluations of any situation. Resorting to violence as either a backup plan or when stealth failed or as a primary pursuit are both valid options but require different genres of intelligence. Rampaging about demands quick reaction time and an intuitive use of the powers for it to feel satisfying. Sure, you could pull up the power wheel to essentially stop time and make a decision at a leisurely pace considering your next step, but there's no fun in that. If you have to stop every few seconds just to ponder how you'll kill the next two people, just to do it again after they're dead feels like hitting every single red light on the way to work. Unless you're Walter White on the way to receive chemo, it's the exact opposite of what you want. I definitely thought that I could almost break the game by abandoning everything that the game offers to take on enemies and all of the other challenges by g giving up not only the powers and gadgets, which I've seen before, but also the sword. It was basically a naked run, but the game held strong. Interacting with the strong core mechanics let this happen. The sword and other weapons, powers, and gadgets can all enhance the gameplay experience by diversifying how the player can approach each situation in a unique way, but they're simply add-ons. Valuable add-ons, but add-ons nonetheless, like getting a phone case. It will make your phone appear cooler and protect it from falls, which are important, but it's not going to affect the performance of the phone or how you interact with the UI. Super Mario 64 was one of the first games to be fully 3D, so Miyamoto and the team worked on chasing a rabbit, MIPS, to guarantee simply moving was easy and made sense to control. I don't know if Arcane had a similar approach, but it sure seems that way because removing every extraneous element still makes interacting with the guards and the environment engaging. Monitoring paths and their vision cones are much more relevant when there is no way to bypass those features. When not naked, you can blink past them, kill them, sleep dart them. There's so many ways to meet any situation that it can mask what mechanics are really at play. Stripping away every mask did not cripple the game, but proved to me that it can stand alone. It may sound boring, but I had a blast and I recommend trying it. Navigating about the environment stealthily, naked or not, is always more complex than killing. The swiftest path from your position to your objective is a straight line, and killing everything along the way allows you to take a very straight path. However, restricting yourself to non-lethal and furthermore no detection involves a deeper understanding of the level. Finding alternative routes and shortcuts are essential and call for matrix-style thinking, whereas straight lines do not. On a very basic level, the stealthy approach needs thought more often, and the lethal approach needs reaction time and power gadget intuition more often. Of course, there are aspects of both on either side, but it's the main division between the two sides. Similar to the three distinct time frames I mentioned earlier, the simple traits of each style appeals to our visceral and intuitive sense of action as humans, as animals. Not every scenario has multiple geographic passages. Escaping doubts and imprisonment from under some wood? I don't know. To leave the building is on a single path and no tributaries peel from it. 
but it's how Dishonored manages segments of restriction and freeness in a sequence that makes the whole game seem open. Avenues of abundant freedom are always placed adjacent to linear, roped-off spaces, generating a rhythm to every mission or group of missions. Balancing this dynamic in the favor of one side much more than the other would make the gameplay stale after some time because the moment-to-moment -moment diversity would lessen. Following the neutralization of Campbell is the Kennels. King Sparrow Fort precedes Havelock's office. The order is occasionally reversed too, like how Caldwin's bridge leads to the area of Sokolov's capture, keeping this rhythm feel fresh. Lady Boyle's last party shows an entire mission of openness can be successful. I also want to highlight what about the Boyle mission was so great. Arcane seems to have really thought about how what they've already included in the game relates to what will come. Corvo's mask could have simply been an excuse to have a magnifier built in, but the mask is actually incorporated into the game logically. He blends in perfectly in the masquerade party and it makes perfect sense. The mission itself can involve socializing with the guests if you choose, which eventually surfaces the non-lethal option. It seems obvious that, of course a mission about a party is going to incorporate talking and socializing in some way, but perhaps it's the cynic in me that thinks many other games wouldn't have the sense to do the same. Looking at the opposite end of the continuum reveals the complexities of playing like a madman. The challenge here that is absent at the other end is being able to manage all of the items and powers automatically and being able to keep track of it all mentally. It is a genuine challenge, but one that really only appears at high levels of play. You won't notice it in the gameplay at the beginning of somebody's first high chaos run, but that style is fun as the player no matter what level. Chaos is a mechanic that penetrates through the entire game. It's not just a little name they gave to unimportant choices that the player makes that changes the end cutscene a little bit. If you opt for killing many people and animals, chapters later in the game will be more heavily guarded than they otherwise would be. Rats and weepers will be more prevalent, and even the characters in the game will treat you in ways that actually affect gameplay instead of just a swapped line of dialogue. For example, Samuel will give your position away at the beginning of the invasion of King Sparrow for the last mission if your chaos is too high. He says that he doesn't like what you've become. Two versions of every mission exist that reflect either your current standing as high or low chaos, and you're told this so you can make decisions after every mission based on your results how you want to conduct yourself in the future. I would hesitate to call it overpowered, but I must question the inclusion of the stealth boots. For quite a while, I purchased that upgrade with barely a second thought, but looking back, it reveals a careful balance that their inclusion destroys. There is a system here and also some microsystems that must be broken down to really get to why this balance is important. Without the stealth boots upgrade, movement has a basic but necessary dynamic in which speed is directly proportional to sound generation. The faster Corvo moves, the more noise he makes with his steps. Hypothetically, the player could go through the entire game crouched to never make any footstep noises, but they might lose their sanity along the way. Likely the case is that they're sprinting and running when available and crouching when necessary. One step closer to the big picture shows the relationship between this microsystem and Blink. Choosing between blinking and walking is also a system in its own right. You can choose to transport instantly and silently at the loss of some mana or keep that mana and move on foot. To move quickly on foot means to make lots of sound, so blinking would probably be better, especially if enemies are nearby. Two things in the game trivialize this excellent balance. The first is the stealth boots. Because you can sprint and not make much noise, it's almost always more beneficial in the long run to run instead of blink because you likely won't get detected anyway. The second is the exorbitant amount of Piero's Remedy. Perhaps it was my playstyle that left me perpetually with the max amount that can be held at 10, but I never really dropped below 8. After using a power, waiting a few seconds recovers a portion of the used mana, and I almost always waited to regain that bit for the sake of efficiency. Maybe this isn't how the majority of people play, which ended up granting me with way too many remedies, but it shouldn't be that way anyway. I think it would make the stealth more high strung and investing if it was always a decision to either blink or run or sprint. With the stealth boots in, both it and blink are low risk options for travel instead of each having pros and cons that must be weighed. Keeping this balance is important to how the game is played at its base level, so simply saying, if you don't like it, don't use it, is not addressing the problem. Dark Vision costs a total of 3 runes for the level 2 upgrade. What comes in the tin though is absurd for the price. At tier 1, even through walls, Corvo can see living things, cone of vision, and the bodies themselves as well as rats. 
Tier 2 adds objects and machinery of interest, although at no tier can anything be seen at an infinite distance. He must be close enough. The drawbacks is that there is a persistent background noise acting essentially as white noise that can be loud enough to hide other important sounds in the environment, and the screen also adopts a sepia filter, which makes elements of the environment marginally harder to see at a distance. However, the background noise can be easily eliminated by canceling a blink before the portion of mana used from dark vision is restored. It's also possible to play the entire game with dark vision enabled, which basically puts the game in very easy mode. You can even use other powers while it's active and it uses very little mana. It does deactivate when Corvo is detected, but it's way too powerful. There are a few options to level the playing field with it and the remaining powers. Higher rune requirement. Disable or limit the use of other powers, for example, only allow blink, or a higher mana requirement. I wouldn't rank the Dishonored soundtrack among my favorite in games of all time, but it certainly services the game quite well. Conceptually, the game presents ideas that match the score about disease and famine, horror, and betrayal. If I were to convert those ideas into adjectives, I would say disease and famine are dilapidation, honor is wholesome, and betrayal is nefarious and venal. It also fits the theme of the Loyalists being isolated in their endeavors, and furthermore, Corvo even feeling like an outsider among the people that rescued him from prison. Finding these bits in the soundtrack is quite easy because the music indicates so clearly what the listener is supposed to be feeling. The main theme encompasses all of these ideas, so let's take a look at how it accomplishes that. Firstly, it's in A flat major, so all of the black keys start us off with a piece that will likely sound off-putting. I won't be making a note-by-note -note analysis, but just looking at the important parts. Let's have a quick listen. The first three notes are F, another F an octave higher, and C. F and C are what's called a perfect fifth, and based on the anatomy of a scale, this makes it very stable. This is what they sound like. The next note is a D flat, only a half step above C, completely disrupting the stable chord, which sets up the feeling of being insecure and precarious for the rest of the piece. It makes me wrinkle my nose and think something is awry. The next bit I want to look at is later on when the dulcimer is playing perfect thirds, fourths, and fifths, which are all very stable and wholesome chords. Then the choir enters, singing perfect thirds, fourths, and fifths, making the entire soundscape sound very welcoming because the voices are warm. To humans, they feel comforting. Lower end instruments like the bass, cello, and baritone voices are given priority, while the higher pitch instruments like the violin are playing quietly in the background, further contributing to the warmth. Then you have an errant, high-pitched A-flat appear from nowhere, once again making the listener feel uneasy. For added effect, the dulcimer that was previously playing stable notes is now playing accidentals, which are notes that aren't in the scale by default. Immediately following that segment is a deep drum and what sounds like a gong and or a chime, giving the impression of impending dread, which I see as betrayal. Also considering the other simply disgusting sounds in this piece, you can see how the music maps perfectly onto what this whole game is about. As standalone music, I wouldn't say it's fantastic, but it's transparent exactly where all of the concepts of the game fit into the music and vice versa. 
It's worth listening to all the way through at least once just to think about the different events of the game and where you'd place them within the music. Doubt as the main character for the Knife of Dunwall offers an interesting change in perspective. He was reduced to a non-element after he assassinated Jessamine in the base game and this DLC explains what he was up to in the meantime and why he had no interaction with Corvo until much later in the game. I've seen many people say that the DLC is much better than the base game, but I don't see it. Because it is only a few hours long, my first run was about three, the narrative feels more tightly paced. You get small chunks of the story more frequently as opposed to the mission then exposition alternation in the base game. Although storytelling was often occurring during missions as well, the main points of what was going to happen next were in between them. Favors are purchasable before every mission that grants you a variety of things like runes or safe combinations. It makes perfect sense that Dowd's minions can do this for him and I think the addition is great. Adding another small objective to pursue in the mission creates more incentive for the player to wander around to see what secrets are hidden and soak in the level design. I feel like I have to address the whale in the room. I knew that Dishonored wasn't going to shy away from dark subjects or imagery the moment I saw Dowd shank Jessamine in the gut and belligerently throw her to the ground. It was done in such a disrespectful and malicious way that it genuinely disturbed me and made me think about what was to come for the rest of the game. Unfortunately, nothing was quite as brutal after that to the point where I actively thought about how disturbed I was. Perhaps the more I played, the more desensitized I got, so I never even had the opportunity to. But when I saw the note describing how to torture this animal in such a way to milk it for all it's got, completely disregarding its well-being, and looked up and saw this poor thing moaning, I, I might be misremembering, but I think I teared up a bit. I wanted to say, good night, sweet prince, may flights of angels wing you to your rest. I really wish the base game introduced hard-hitting imagery as much as this moment did. Further highlighting how decrepit the world is with absolutely grotesque moments occasionally would have really contributed to the mood. The only thing I can think of that's remotely as disturbing, and it's not even the same kind of disturbing, is when he can offer Lady Boyle to Brisby and he boats her away. Cause, um, it's kinda weird. Reason will prevail! Corrupted Bone Charms were introduced in Brigmore Witches, which was one of the strongest pillars of the DLC. I don't hesitate at all to say that they should have been implemented in the base game. Using them in a few hour DLC didn't offer much time to live with them. The latter half of the level itself assumes the conceptual approach that the level with Dow did in the base game but transformed it to be immensely more labyrinthine. The former half is much more open like a traditional Dishonored mission, matching much more closely to the Flooded District than any other area. Speaking of the former half, Dowd begins by breaking Lizzie Stride out of prison. He needs a boat to get to Brigmore Manor and she's our best shot. She faints when we release her from her restraint, so we must exit Coldridge without the use of our right hand. We haven't seen this type of objective before, and although it's not terribly genius or unique, I'm glad for its few minute inclusion. The least interesting part of the DLC is the following part when we must infiltrate a factory to retrieve a coil that powers the boat. This involves us going into the sewers to revive the water flow for the people of the factory, introducing us to the witches. Sitting on a platform is a woman asking for help as she's broken her leg. I decided to look around a bit first though, and when I was cranking the wheel to open the door, I heard another woman whisper that someone was coming, referencing the player. At this point, my suspicions were confirmed that this was a trap, and there aren't enough of these in Dishonored. Yeah, there are their traditional tripwire snares, but once you've seen one, you've seen them all. Inattentive or dim-witted players might actually fall for the witch trap on their first go and have to deal with the consequences, but the concept could be carried further by allowing careful and curious players to discover something that nullifies a trap and avoiding it altogether. For example, if somebody was pretending to be injured but the player could light a fire nearby the person, they would catch fire and burn to death running away. Instead, a trap existing just for the sake of itself allowed the player to interact with it in some way. The witch on the platform pretending to be injured was a step in the right direction, but evolving it more to become a mechanic would have been beneficial. So we return to the factory to inform Trimble that the water's working again, retrieve the coil, return to the boat, and we're off to Brigmore Manor. A small open area precedes the building itself. Our final objective is to stop Delilah from assuming direct control over Emily. But first we must find her studio where she was working on the painting of Emily that she could use to get into her bot- uh, um, Yeah, get, get into her body. 
this segment of the mission is the most exhilarating because there isn't a direct clear path from the outside of the manor to the room, so you basically have to give yourself a tour of the crib until you find exactly where to go, meanwhile attempting to avoid all of the witches patrolling the place. Character modeling on the witches was excellent. I thought Dowd's men had the coolest appearance out of any characters in the game until I saw the witches. The many flowers on the outfit act as a bridge between the formalness of the jacket and the naturalness of the vines, or whatever they are, on their skin. Their skin even transforms when they're aggroed and then returns to normal when they're dead or not on high alert. In function, however, they're very similar to Dowd's men. They can apparate, fire projectiles, and pull. It's done well, so I'm not going to complain too much, but I would have liked to see more than a clone of a previously encountered enemy. Another new aspect is sentient statues. They've been bewitched by these women and can become aware of your presence, so they're basically stationary guards, adding more variety in how you should be moving around the environment. Their inclusion was anemic though, because I can count on one hand how many times I actually encountered them, and I can count on one hand less than that how many times they were an inconvenience or added any meaningful challenge. Yet another unique enemy type was the dog skulls. Inanimate skulls would rest on the floor until the player got close enough. Not only is this a brilliant twist on the current standard dog, but the concept of them was introduced perfectly. At the very beginning of the manor segment of the DLC, you can see a ring of glowing flowers in front of you. Any normal person would be intrigued by this, and getting closer shows a thing sitting in the grass. Once you step inside the ring, the dog comes to life and starts attacking you. It's perfect because there is nothing else around that could be distracting you from dealing with this dog and also demonstrates its exact activation radius. Overall, the intricate and compact feeling of the manor alone elevates Big More Witches as a DLC far above its counterpart. It implemented more simultaneously unique and successful concepts. It's natural to wish that all of these ideas from both DLCs were included in the base game, but I think that would detract from how clean the gameplay felt because of its simplicity. And the fact that I wish so many things from the DLCs were in the base game is an indicator that they were complete and valuable. I almost hesitate to say that Brigmore Witches is stronger than the base game because that's bordering on, if not already committing, blasphemy and heresy. But I say that just to illustrate how positively I regard the Brigmore Witches. So Rarely do I see a game that's so polished and unique. It seems that many contemporary games think that I'm going to enjoy the game more if I have more stuff, and I have a lot of stuff to do, so a lot of games are crammed with a bunch of stuff. But that's all it is, just stuff. But I value a game based on what I'm experiencing, and what that game is making me think rather than how much stuff I have. Dishonored opts for the latter, and offers gameplay that is perpetually engaging. No matter how many times I will come back to it, I will always enjoy myself because there's always something different to do. There's always a different route or a different playstyle. Dishonored respects me as a player and as an intelligent and curious human that can make my own decisions. I don't have to sit through lengthy tutorials or absurdly long cutscenes that take me away from the gameplay. Dishonored understands me and caters to my interests as one who plays video games. Video games are about traveling to another universe and operating under its rules, and Dishonored cares that I might or might not be interested in that universe and offers me extra information about everything that's going on via all the notes and letters and books. It's a shame that I have to use the word extra instead of that being a default. I don't know about you, but I noticed that I was talking exclusively in the first person in that last paragraph. I didn't once use the phrase, the player, in an attempt to maintain some air of objectivity, whether I was being objective or not. And that's because I have a deep appreciation and empathy for a game when it appreciates me in return.